Borderlands 1 was a f***ing vibe. I and many other people were hungry for stat-based RPG mechanics in first-person shooters, and you could tell because if you isolate the gunplay, this game is not very impressive, but it did numbers. I think it's cool how firefights end with no fanfare and resume the ambient, lonely guitar twangs. It's pretty atmospheric. The guns kind of felt and looked like toys, and the millions of guns that were advertised ultimately boiled down to a few dozen with a few variations on them, not counting the legendaries. Also, I loved how visceral this simple game felt with how often enemies explode. Super fun. You couldn't really get this kind of gameplay from anywhere else at the time, and it was obvious they didn't really know what they were doing. Nobody did. Uh, I still think they managed to leave some narrative breadcrumbs for some invested fans to follow, even if it led nowhere at the time. So what happened in Borderlands 1? Uh, the Vault Hunters flock to Pandora in search of... Uh, wacky surprise here. <laughs> the Vault. Uh, there exists a legend that says anyone who opens it will be granted anything their heart desires from wealth, fame, and power. It's like the One Piece. The Vault Hunters, if they weren't born on Pandora, were greeted by a lawless desert of a planet. Regular citizens fear for their life and are rarely found outside of large hubs. They go where they can survive. Everyone else are likely part of different gangs on Pandora. They focus on their hedonistic lifestyle revolving around murder. There's not much glean from them in terms of character. These killers largely consist of prisoners and abandoned excavation workers employed by one of the several companies looking for the vault as an investment. Towards the end of the game, you are met with an officer from the Atlas Corporation who has been taunting you occasionally throughout the game. In a final confrontation, she herself opens the vault in front of the player, clearly expecting some sort of power to wash over her, but is instead skewered by a creature erupting from the vault that the vault hunters then destroy. Very standard, nothing too exciting. It's revealed that the vault is actually an ancient alien technology meant to seal the vault monster. That itself is pretty interesting, but we're also introduced to Tannis, who is a vault researcher employed by the Dahl Corporation. By the time the game takes place, Dahl has pulled their resources and abandoned their excavation site. Tannis has some dark recordings you can find in a side mission that detail her descent into obsession. She gradually loses her humanity and common sense in search of the vaults and is the last researcher alive when we meet her. She comes across as unstable and lonely, given that her logs say she wanted to savor the last conversation with her colleague before she died, despite calling her fat girl Shanae in the very same log and noting that she didn't even like her. Day. I was woken up, hoping I was having a reoccurring nightmare. Depressing stuff, and it shows the potential for storytelling in the setting of Pandora. That's not to say the game was devoid of humor. <laughs> How can I help? Hey, you see my gun? Scooter's a hoot and holler with how he's constantly talking about how he wants to kill Lucky with his stereotypical hick accent. Like, look, he's just some dude sitting on a toilet, bro's chillin'. You first meet Zed, the doctor, when he's nonchalantly carving up a dead body. Uh, do it look like he give a fart? TK Baja is another one of the early characters you meet that likes to make jokes about how blind he is. He's my guy. He's my slime, bro. Hey, thanks. I know it's rough out here, and a lot of people barely have time to, to help themselves, much less anybody else. Just know that your help means a whole lot. All right, see you soon. <laughs> you don't get it, do you? It doesn't matter. Just come home back whenever you want. There's some pretty dry and genuine humor in this that might get a chuckle out of you. Uh, I feel it won't make or break the experience for anyone, though. The humor is certainly not the focus of the game's writing. Borderlands 2 takes that hopeless and depressing atmosphere and says, And fuck that shit. <laughs> Pandora is no longer a desert without any resources, now it has a tundra, volcanoes, toxic bogs, even a little bit of green here and there. Oh wait, oh this will be a good shot for the uh, the video. You know how to disable the HUD, right? Wait, is it a is it a command in this game? I think it's like F11. Oh, F11. It's one of the F keys, I wanna oh, say. Drop my gun. Oh well. Much more variety in the environments. Builds are way more exciting and varied in their play styles. Weapons are way more distinct. The gunplay is very similar, but much more seamless. The story establishes so much in this entry as well. The main characters are the new wave of Vault Hunters attracted to Pandora by the call sent out by Handsome Jack, the unofficial ruler of Pandora by force, and the president of Hyperion to hunt the Vault for him. 
the Vault Hunters pretty quickly swerve from that and experience an assassination attempt via a bomb on a train. After that, you land on the tundra and are discovered and assisted by Claptrap, who is sent to dig up the crash site for loot. After finding you, he tries to arm you and attempts to help him escape slavery. After this, the journey is set in motion and it is just so much fun. Old Vault Hunters make appearances and are treated with immense respect, being placed in either positions of power or just legendary figures. Mordecai is reconnaissance for the Crimson Raiders and is the greatest sniper on the planet. Lilith acts as the Firehawk, a third party that keeps gangs in check and draws attention away from Sanctuary. Roland is the leader of the Crimson Lance, who used to be employed by the Atlas Corporation before they went under for the massive damage suffered by the Vault Hunters. Brick is now the leader of a gang of his own and revels in the violence. He left the Crimson Raiders due to differing opinions. He was in favor of much more brutal methods of intel extraction. The new side characters are also a treat. Hammerlock is silly and eccentric. Ellie is a fat mechanic who's pretty chill and excited to help out, while Tiny Tina is literally and metaphorically an explosive child. Neither of them are played seriously during their time in the main story, but that didn't work against them. They were used sparingly and to great effect. I wanted to know more about how Tina came to be alone. Hammerlock and Ellie always made some welcome appearances. Scooter the mechanic, his mom Moxie the sexy bartender, Zed the doctor, and Marcus the arms dealer set up shop in Sanctuary, the main hub of the game. By the way, I forgot to write it earlier, so I'm just going to say it right now. Uh, Borderlands 2 has my favorite hub town of any video game ever. I love Sanctuary. I love just chilling in Sanctuary with my buddies before we actually start playing Borderlands. Nah, bro. Can't. The fuck is you doing? I'm gambling, bro. You're grambling? I'm grambling. That's mine. Look, man, 90% of gamblers quit right before they hit big. Oh! Tennis is also back. She's true to her original counterpart, insulting to others, scared of interactions, yet a slight hint of loneliness in her ramblings. She also adopted a coping mechanism of personification to give herself someone to talk to. It happened while she was captured and being tortured in between the events of 1 and 2 by Handsome Jack's men for the sake of intel on vaults. She was rescued and is now protected within Sanctuary. Again, these characters don't overstay their welcome. It makes me want to get to know more about them in their side missions. It's great how they set up intrigue to get you to play more of the content. Tennis discovers that Handsome Jack has been charging the vault key during the story to awaken the warrior, a monster sealed by the vault. Throughout the story, Handsome Jack taunts you, constantly getting the better of you till about halfway through the game. You find out that the guiding voice from Borderlands 1 is Angel, Handsome Jack's daughter. You find out when she finally betrays you to allow for Handsome Jack to breach the sanctuary shields and destroy it. After that, she starts acting on her own, helping you find her to get the key to the new vault. After making it through the defenses, you meet Angel and find out she's a siren and has been used to charge the key. After killing her, Handsome Jack shows up himself to kill you. In a few swift movements, he kills Roland from behind, captures Lilith with the same technology that kept Angel subdued, and would have killed you if Lilith hadn't teleported you back to Sanctuary. With Lilith's powers, he's able to charge the key to completion. Once you confront him, the warrior awakens, and after killing the warrior, you kill Jack. Before you do, you can see just how delusional he was. To the very end, he believed he was the hero, believed he was entitled to the power in the vault and was unstable in his justification to himself. Justification for killing an entire planet of people. No, 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 I can't. I like this. Not when I'm so close. And not at the hands of a filthy bandit! Not that! See, I could have saved this planet. See, I, I could have actually restored order. And I wasn't supposed to die by the hands of a child killing psychopath! You're a savage! You're a maniac! You are a bandit! And I am the goddamn hero! The warrior was practically a god. How? How in the hell have you killed my warrior? Shut up, bitch! <laughs> He's a frustrating and confusing character, but 
definitely memorable for how oddly he behaved. Borderlands 2 was a great game. It didn't take itself seriously, but when it did, I really felt it. I think this was mainly done by using side characters and humor at appropriate times. Serious moments were given time to breathe. This game was certainly more lighthearted than the first, but that didn't prevent me from getting attached to these characters and appreciating the amount of lore provided for small characters, other planets, companies, and locations. This game also inspired me artistically. I really want to make a story involving a Mad Max style setting and sci-fi level technology and dystopic corporate rule. I've been doodling in my notebooks for years since. I'll probably write a book someday if I feel like I can actually form something coherent. I don't even think this game is a masterpiece, but it inspired me. And this is all because of my intense obsession with Borderlands as a 13 year old. I realize it's not perfect and that not everyone will like the humor, the story, or even the gameplay, but it's got a seriously special place in my heart. Borderlands 2 killed what Borderlands was and made something super fun. Ooh, Borderlands 3, I was excited, dude. I saw the reveal trailer, cool concept for the next villains, awesome playable character designs, the gameplay looks like Borderlands, but even more modern. I was ready, dude, and what did I think of it? It was alright. It was pretty good, actually. Overall, I really enjoyed it, and I had a great time during the first playthrough. I thought it was seriously lacking in endgame content, though. I mean, all there was to do was collect guns, and uh, after a while it felt meaningless before they actually added some tough bosses. Something to actually use your cool weapons on. Oh, but the presentation. Oh, the environments were dropped and gorgeous. Obviously not the peak of graphical fidelity, but designed in such a way that makes everywhere you walk a work of art. The monster designs were fucking sick. The gun models make a lot of what you collect feel unique to one another. And the sound effects, dude, these might be the greatest gun sounds of all time in any game ever. Everything's got a kick to it. Sometimes I'd be reloading just to hear what the weapons sound like because they all look spot on for how they sound. It also adds a weight to the weapon in my head. I feel like I know how they would feel in my hands. All artists who work on this. Good lord, you're fucking cracked. You're so good. It's so cool, dude. If I was just talking about the gameplay, this video would end on a pretty positive note. Uh, I ain't though. Uh, so the praise stops here. Um, the story sucks, dude. Plain and simple. Sorry. Well, you know what? That's a bit too harsh. Now that I've played it again, far removed from my original thoughts and expectations, I can feel like I can form a proper opinion on it now, so... What happened in Borderlands 3? I don't think you need to be tied down to previous entries to make a good sequel. As established before, Borderlands 2 took the games in a new direction, and I believe it was for the better. Borderlands 3 just abandoned some characters' original intentions, makes strange decisions narratively, and sacrifices good moments of tension for the sake of jokes. It's hard to sit through if you were ever invested in the game series. I'm not kidding when I say I like to turn off the dialogue in new playthroughs, so I'm just left with a fantastic gameplay and art direction. The story itself is relatively simple, but pretty wordy, so strap in. The Calypso twins, who have siren powers, have started weaponizing the aimless psychos on Pandora by forming a cult and using online entertainment like streaming and videos. Cool concept, I think. The new generation of Vault Hunters are recruited to help defend the Crimson Lance and Sanctuary 3, which is now a traveling spaceship. Sanctuary got destroyed in a DLC created in preparation for Borderlands 3, just so you know if you didn't. Before Sanctuary 3's first takeoff, it is assaulted by the Children of the Vault, the aforementioned cult where the leaders, the twins, reveal their powers of sapping others' life force by taking Lilith's powers. The main characters are tasked with collecting the power from all vaults before the twins are allowed to seize them. Maya and her 2B siren apprentice Ava are picked up to help with the vault in Promethea, a planet controlled by the character Rhesus Company, the newly revived Atlas Corporation. Promethea is being assaulted by the Maliwan Corporation for the up-and-comer's assets before they have more power to resist. After killing the president of Maliwan and meeting up with Zero and Reese, you make your way to the vault Reese has kept hidden from the vault hunters to ensure their help. There, Maya assists you with the vault monster sealed inside before Ava makes herself known. She tagged along. Ava's intrusion causes a moment of weakness for Maya, and the twins use this to absorb her powers and even her physical form, turning her to dust. After this, they solve a deadly family dispute and wrestle for power with the largest company on Eden 6, the Jacobs Company. The Jacobs family then allows them entry into the vaults as thanks, where it is defeated and the twins take advantage of the situation once again by capturing Tannis, the Crimson Lance's vault researcher. After fighting through where she's held captive on Pandora, she reveals herself to be a siren who inherited Angel's powers. We also find out powers can be passed on to the chosen vessel because of this. Tannis warns that the twins are now capable of opening the vault they've had their eyes on the entire time, which is just the entire planet of Pandora. After killing Troy, while Tyrene opens the 
Vault, Tyreen then absorbs her brother's power and is far more powerful than before. Ava finds she's inherited Maya's powers after Troy's death and finally becomes a siren like she was being trained for. Tyreen escapes. As the Great Vault begins its opening, the main cast is contacted by the first Vault Hunter, Typhon de Leon which happens to be the twins' dads. There, we discover that he restricted their lives to protect them since they're sirens, which explains their lust for power and attention. On this planet of Necrotefeo, he mentions that the ancient alien civilizations developed the vaults as prisons, and he can use them to reseal the waking vault monster from the planet they're standing on, Necrotefeo. Tyrene appears, kills him, and makes her way back to Pandora to absorb the power of the vault monster. After this, she is killed by the new vault hunters, but it doesn't stop the destruction of Pandora. Lilith uses her reclaim powers from Tyrene's death to reseal the vault and prevent the destruction of the planet after passing on the Crimson Raiders to Ava. This act presumably kills her. The remaining characters bask in the glow of the sacrifice. Those are some long ass spark notes, I'm sorry about that, but I feel like it was important. I don't think it's a bad outline for a story. I absolutely think that this could have been accomplished in an interesting way, but the execution failed horribly for me. Like I mentioned before, the game is all too willing to sacrifice tension for a joke. I replayed the game recently to better understand my feelings on this, and honestly, it's not as bad as I remember. But there are some moments that still feel terrible to watch. Go, 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 go! Siren life! Shut up, shut up, shut up! Die! 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 For lack of a better, more polite term. After Maya's death, the cast just stand around, and Tannis is written to treat her death like it meant nothing. When she was alive, I preferred her that way. That didn't come out right. But she's gone, and that's how it is. All we can do is fight to honor her memory the best we can. People die in wars. By the droves. I mean, open your eyes, people. Don't ask me to speak at your funeral, Lilith. It doesn't mean anything. It shouldn't mean nothing. For as cold as Tannis appears to be, she's always appreciated those around her and expresses her loneliness and isolation on occasion. If you were as deep into the Borderlands lore as me as a creepy teenager, you'd know that Tannis had a little crush on Maya. I didn't expect them to remember that with all the writers coming in and all, but to just have her disregard that death just felt like a betrayal, and it doesn't allow the moment any time to breathe. One of the best things that Borderlands 2 did after a death was prevent fast travel. You had to take your time and walk back to wherever you needed to go. You had to wander through Marcus's stockroom when you got teleported after Roland's death. What happened? What the hell just happened? First Bloodwing, now this? Vault Hunter, find me a sanctuary. We gotta get Lilith back. It was quiet. There was even a mission where you could inform the residents of Sanctuary of Roland's death, too. It was really interesting to hear these larger-than-life characters grapple with mortality. Here, it's just right back to business after a shit little eulogy and barely anybody saying anything. There was a deleted scene I feel would have brought a lot together for people that was supposed to take place after Maya's death. Tannis starts her little speculation dump and Lilith basically tells her to shut up, which is super fair for the moment. Ava doesn't shoot blame towards Lilith like in the release game, she just kind of wallows in her sorrow. There's also some background characters just standing, which would have added a lot to the feeling that Sanctuary 3 doesn't have just like six people on it. This is a side tangent, by the way. It feels like Lilith is a leader of the Crimson Raiders for no fucking reason, because we don't hear anything from the people on board ever, or even receive a mission from them, aside from this silly dinosaur. It's funny. Please laugh. I don't know why I'm shit talking Maurice like that. <laughs> Maurice is my guy, man. Maurice is shatteringly honored to be aboard the Sanctuary. I love you. Mwah. The crew later stands by the fire and mourns the loss of Maya as Ava looks on from above, perched on a ledge. Ava puts blame on herself instead of the characters we all know and are already attached to, like in the base game. Ava even says Maya wasted her life on her. It's a much more down-to-earth way to get to know Ava than the side mission that actually came with the base game. I don't feel like getting into it over that, you know, it was trying too hard to be funny and was just boring. Lilith even relates her experiences to Ava by alluding to Roland's death and reveals that she believes she's to blame for it. Not only does this warm me to Ava and puts some things into perspective, Lilith gets some profound development here as well. They sit in silence and watch as the characters pay tribute to Maya before resolving to go to Eden Six. If this scene were in the game, I could forgive every cringy thing that Ava said. Ava's a kid with no friends. Of course she's gonna be weird and say stupid shit to sound cool. I can open this tomb up no sweat. 
what you got, Tomb. You got nothing. I think she was intentionally written annoying to hammer that home. I don't know what happened though. Some people believe the scene was drawn after the game was made to calm people about the writers on staff, but I think it fits the narrative too perfectly not to be a part of the original planning phase. This little bit here would have made the characters much more understandable. And while I don't think it would have justified Lilith literally passing on the Crimson Raiders to Ava, some kid, it would have made me appreciate the sentiment, uh, if only a little more. Also, what's with this Marvel movie ass shot here of her flying into the fucking moon to sacrifice herself? Tannis is like, what's she doing? She's gonna kill herself! And Ava's like, she knows. Eyes sparked with inspiration, smile on her face, looking towards the sky like, shut up, dude! You didn't earn that! You just lashed out at Lilith when you got Maya killed, and you didn't even appear to be sorry! You inherited her powers and did nothing with them! Oh, it did not help that she had some cringy 13-year-old energy as well. Always trying to crack a joke. Borderlands doesn't have to be the most serious thing ever. It wasn't from the beginning, but characters, Vaughn, Reese, Ava, they represent the opposite end of the spectrum that's just embarrassing to listen to. I feel ashamed for having purchased this at some points, dude. Like, I should have waited for a sale. What's weird is that I don't think that the writers are incapable of writing something at least serviceable. All of the DLC dealt with new and old characters with some pretty cool moments. Hell, most of Bounty of Blood was played pretty straight and I thought it was pretty good. Neat setting, simple story, cool villain. Uh, I know I'm not alone in that sentiment either. I heard one of my friends say that the game was just too woke and it panders too hard. My immediate reaction was like, uh, to who? Like, what are you talking about, dude? Borderlands already had a lot of women. Uh, gays. Uh, gay women. I pressed him on it and he was like, I don't know, dude, it was just woke. Another friend of mine explained the thought process a little better. All of the male characters were stuffed to the side and shown to be incompetent while the women characters were made to be much better by comparison. I don't even think that fucking matters. Uh, Ava was meant to be a character you root for, but with blatant flaws written into her character too. Lilith was always like this. Uh, it doesn't outright say it in Borderlands 3, but she's not a perfect leader since the role was kind of thrusted onto her. She's trying to live up to Roland. Ellie doesn't have too much responsibility outside of her engineer duties. She was always just a big bitch chillin'. She's honoring Scooter's memory by taking up his position. Tannis always played a huge part in the games, and I think the writers just really liked her and wanted a more prominent amount of dialogue for her and made a very strange decision of having Angel pass on her powers to her. I think it would have made a lot more sense to pass it on to Gage, dude. A technopathy ability given to a literal technomancer? That's her class name. God, it would have been so perfect, dude. Plus, Angel was directly talking to her throughout most of Borderlands 2. I don't know, it was just fucking odd, dude. As for the male characters, Marcus is still Marcus. Uh, opportunist, capitalist, kind of a dick. They fucking bastardized Vaughn and Reese, though. Because I played and adored the original Tales from the Borderlands, I'm not sure what I dislike more, their dialogue in this game or Ava's inclusion. They just took what they thought was funny about Vaughn and turned him into a caricature. Come on, let's get out of here. I'll lead the way. Even though I'm totally unarmed. Can't let him know you're afraid and totally defenseless, bro. Bandit life! He was elected leader in Tales from the Borderlands by the people of the crashed Hyperion ship for his knowledge of Pandora and familiarity with their nightmare corporate hellscape culture. He was crafty, dependable, chill, and just a kind dude. He was also a massive nerd and adrenaline junkie by the end of the game, and that's all he is in the new game literally in his underwear, wandering around like a fucking dumbass. I have no idea why they took his character there. Just look at Vaughn in the final chapter of Tales. Look at him! He's my friend! Reese was always a pretty goofy individual, but he was intentional with his business decisions. He was compassionate towards his friends and understood others in a place of work. He also became way more accustomed to life-threatening situations by the end of the story. A silly, but ultimately reliable force for good. Low is mine. Or break, break his heart. heart. What do these mean? They mean what you think they mean. And let you leave with that, pal. Oh no? And what are you gonna do about it? Yeah, that's what I thought. What? What? What the fuck? Looks like he had a change of heart. <laughs> That's, yeah, that's, I was, I, I was like, that has to be <laughs> something. Holy shit, telling a story, that's super fun. In the new game, he's just coincidentally the head of a company, constantly fumbling in dealings with others. It would have been fine for Maliwan to have more firepower than Atlas and need help from the Vault Hunters, but he just acted so desperate. I feel like he would have been past that at this point, you know, since he's in the middle of a war with Maliwan. He's also far too concerned about a fucking frozen yogurt stand. Say goodbye to your favorite Frogurt stand! Not friends! Frogurt stand! Anything but friends! Frogurt! They, 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 they give you the... Frogurt falling in 3, 2, 1. Fresh fruit! Oh, 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 oh
Every line with him was just joke after joke after joke. It was agonizing. He literally doesn't believe his dying men as they're being slashed to pieces by what they assume to be Zero. Feeling it! Reese, it looks like Zero murdered all the defense personnel. Oh, no, 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 no. Zero's loyalty is not in question. Wherever he is, he must have a good reason. You just focus on kicking out Malawan. Soldier, don't you dare use your last words to slander Zero. Say you're being murdered by someone else. I oh, come on! It doesn't create an internal struggle in him like, oh no, did I make the wrong decision and jeopardize my men's safety? That's supposed to be his defining feature against his corporate rivals and the reason we don't want to kill him as opposed to any other corporate leader. He's supposed to care about his workers. It's just desperation to fill dead air with laughter. I would have preferred dead air, honestly. I really don't think this is some woke agenda or whatever the fart you want to call it. Just a misunderstanding of what made certain characters great and a questionable final execution of some neat ideas. I have just been rambling, dude. Sorry about that. Borderlands used to mean a lot to me. Uh, it was that one hyper fixation I had growing up. I was just super disappointed that they got the writing wrong for the third game. I know that art is subjective, but nah. Nah, they got it wrong, bro. This shit is incorrect, man. Fuck. If I were to take elements of the story and do something with it to make it more palatable to me, uh, I would take out a ton of jokes first. Eventually, you know, this stuff is just white noise. I would turn the mission involving ice Tea's silly little robot character and make it a side quest. Uh, I skipped that bit in the briefing because it doesn't matter at all. I'm not kidding, by the way, if you haven't played Borderlands, the rapper Ice-T was a character in the main story of Borderlands 3, and uh, it went on for a, a fucking while. Cram it, Genevieve. I got a friend now. We're here for the key fragment. I know you got it in the security hole. He's an AI. Uh, in a bear. If you got a bunch of comedy bits you'd like to do like that, you know, I'd definitely save that for a side quest. There was also a main mission with a character named Clay, too. Not really worth mentioning. Should have been a side mission, too. I'd probably try to make it ever to have the Calypso Twins Echo Net content be a little bit more entertaining, too, rather than cynically taking the concept of an internet celebrity and printing it onto a villain. All their content was just dumb. Look at this. It's meant to be a video that they show off after killing Maya and like rally support. Uh, maybe the point was to get me to hate them, but it just looks too lame. It also feels kind of mean-spirited towards what people actually enjoy about online content creators. It was also a missed opportunity to talk about parasocial relationships as well, a relatively hot topic in this new age of internet entertainment. I would have tried to expand a bit more on the psychology behind the twins and their growing need for the universe to acknowledge them and their existence because of their total isolation. It's a relatable plot point for lots of people today. Maybe show off their childhood bedrooms too. I feel like that would have been pretty interesting. There was also the growing little feud between the twins that was left unexplored. I, I thought it would have been really cool to see Troy betray Tyreen once he finally got enough power to stand up for himself because it really felt like he was living in her shadow. Their dynamic always seemed like a thing where they were both pulling for dominance once Troy got some agency in his own. is awesome. We haven't really had a chance to get to know each other, huh? And Ty's been doing most of the talking. She does that, right? She's the center of the galaxy, and the rest of us just sort of orbit around her. You know, Tyreen says we should let you keep playing along. Yeah, a little competition gets our followers all riled up. <laughs> but I'm not one of them. No, not anymore. I'm done getting table scraps. Also, this is a vague criticism and not very constructive, sorry, uh, but they just didn't feel super threatening. I'm not sure what I would have done to make their presence more felt. Oh yeah, and turn Reese and Vaughn back into who they actually are. These might as well be completely different characters, it just upset me to hear them talk at all. Take away a few dozen lines from Tannis to reduce her role. Uh, that character is kind of grating after extended periods of time. Minecart called Kate. She will show you the way. When our tracks are in separate ways, as they say. Now, that's the minecart. Just trust me on this one. Oh, 
Speaking of Tannis' role, this is probably way too much to change, um, but I would have made Gage the next Angel Siren. Just saying. The Jacobs family plotline was really straightforward. I would try to make an effort to condense the missions and map of Eden 6 a bit more. Give the B-team a bigger role too, or just way more side missions, because they were the coolest characters in 2. They're still cool, you barely used them dude, come on, it feels like they were included out of necessity. And finally that Ava scene. If it was included, it would have made the character mean a lot more to the audience, or it would have meant a lot more to me, at least. I know there's an issue of how the COV came to power and how it seems like Lilith was doing absolutely nothing. I probably would have tried to make that make a little more sense. Regardless of what I think, a story with plot holes can still be great with good character writing. Unfortunately, Borderlands 3 did not deliver on that for me. Borderlands was killed once again, and it'll never have that thoughtful character writing and lore that I loved to follow. That's pretty evident in the release of the new Tales from the Borderlands, which just spits in the face of everything the series accomplished with its writing. Choosing to view itself as a sitcom, that's a real quote from one of the writers. It also trambles over the fantastic groundwork laid by Tales 1, which felt like a celebration of Borderlands and uh, kind of the exact fan fiction I would have thought about when I was 13, except way better than I could have ever done. There is one thing that all the mainline Borderlands games still share, no matter what. The actual environments and music accompanying them fucking bang. Borderlands 3's writing kind of sucks, but when you turn off the dialogue and just look at the world around you and these locations, you get a feel for what this game could be. Just exist with me for a second in these places. In terms of gameplay, mainline Borderlands games are only getting better. Bigger, brighter, sleeker, faster. Maybe you don't give a shit about anything I mentioned and just enjoy the games for what it did right. But I really care about the atmosphere. The vibe. I hope Borderlands hasn't lost that forever. That's all I really got. This kind of just turned into a rant and I apologize, but maybe you're into that sort of thing. Maybe you feel like me about it or you haven't ever played one, but you feel like hearing a long ass video on something you'll never care about. <laughs> I've been there, dude. It's one of my favorite pastimes. Anyway, thanks for joining me. I'm Frogwater. Uh, if you want more Borderlands stuff for me, I have a low effort content channel where me and my friend just shoot the shit about Borderlands and we made a tier list of the characters in lore. Uh, check it out if you're already a huge nerd over this stuff. Later.